So it's Friday night at the Golden Door. I'm Kathy Vaness, and this is our Friday night speaker series. And we get to be outside in this beautiful evening with a very special guest on Art Week, which is a very fun week. And I'm with tonight Alex Renoir. I mean, how amazing to be sitting with a legend and someone that comes from a legendary family. So we're, Alexander Renoir is the great grandson of Pierre Auguste Renoir. His great-grandfather has largely been credited for developing the Impressionistic style, which has since become one of the most popular and beloved art forms. Alex is the first direct descendant of Pierre Auguste Renoir to actually take a painting. We have a lot of interesting stories to talk about that, so he's the only one taking on the moniker. And so there's the first question. You're carrying on the family's banner. Yes. That must be a lot of pressure. What's that like? Well, figure it this way. Um, if your last name in, is Renoir, by law you have to throw a paintbrush at a canvas at least once. <laughs> um, but like pasta, if it sticks, you know, it, it works. But for the vast majority, it just didn't. Um, everyone after my great-grandfather, his three sons, my grandfather included, um, sort of looked around and said, look, Dad was humongous. He was like one of the, the greats, the masters one of Impressionism. Of and so that was such a big shadow for them. They didn't feel that they could really go into that field themselves. Uh, and they didn't have the interest for it. And so they looked around and Pierre Auguste Renoir dies in 1919. In 1920, what is the newest art form that has never come before? Cinema. So they all went into making movies. Um, Jean Renoir, the second son, is a pioneer in cinematography. He invented the thing. Um, Isn't that all amazing? My, all my cousins are actors and actresses, directors, producers, cinematographers, and um, everyone gives it a shot, and I did too. And the director says, Alex, Alex, it's like you don't care. That's because I didn't. <laughs> so so that Alex, wasn't my thing. you know, as a world, we love icons. We, 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 we love them, we, we make them larger than life. What was it like from your father and your grandfather's perspective? What was dinner like? What was it like being a Renoir? Well, it, normal. It was just the way it was. I thought that everybody growing up had a 500 book library on their ancestry, you know, at home. I thought it was normal. Everyone had this. You know, my, my friends would come over. The, the house is, is covered in statues and art and stuff, and it was normal. To me, at least, you know, same for my father and, and all the way back. That's just how it sort of was. So for me, I never really knew any different. When somebody asks you, well, how does it feel to be you? Uh, kind of like me, I guess. It's true. It's your family. You know, the, the, there is a big legacy behind. I mean, the, but one thing that I try to, to portray to let everybody understand is that he was still, you know, a, a hardworking, if a little strange guy. And I've got so many stories behind it. Well, that t that's really perfect, mm. because what can you tell us about Renoir that we don't know? Oh. What are the insider kind of secrets that you'd say, this was just a real man, and here's some stories that you might never see like in an art book? Boy, <laughs> everybody has uh, family stories uh, about crazy Aunt Susan that did strange things on the lawn, and mine happened to be named Renoir. Um, and actually, I've got one of those stories, but I'll, I'll go to a different one, <laughs> where when my great-grandfather was uh, learning to paint while putting himself through school um, at L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, he would make, well, let's not quite call them knockoffs, of um, Eugène de la Croix, which was an, this other artist, very popular at the time, and the English tourists would buy those paintings by the bucket load. And there's an entire group of people uh, in England that are very, very mad. They have a fake Eugène de la Croix painting. They don't know they have a real Renoir. I'll take it. <laughs> but, you know, little stories like that. There's one, um, you know, the, 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 the luncheon of the boating party was a response to a, a reporter from Le Figaro in Paris who said, actually the guy coined the term Impressionist before they wanted to be known as the uh, European Society of Nonconformist Painters 
for something like that. And that doesn't really roll off the tongue <laughs> so easily. And then there was this guy um, whose name was Wolf from Le Figaro who said that these guys aren't Barbizon and they're not a realist and they're not real painters. They only paint impressions of things. They are impressionists. And it's stuck. And so that really kind of worked. Also, wow. they wanted to be known as Monet, uh, Manet's gang because Manet had money and the rest of them did not. But so you mentioned something earlier. You told me this great story about how he felt when he finished his art. Uh, Let's share that with our guests. Uh, later on, um, after the, the trials and tribulations of uh, Le Salon in Paris, they used to say, if you're an artist, you have to be in the Salon. And if you're sort of an artist, you'd have to be in the Salon de Refusé, which is the reject salon. And if you're not in either of those, you're not an artist at all. The first Impressionist uh, um, gallery showing was in a photography studio, which the artists in the day hated because why stand in front of this artist for a week and maybe get your portrait when you can stand in front of this guy over here for only 10 minutes and get your picture, right? But the Impressionists loved it because they could map out where light hits. They were the painters of light. And so it, it opened up the whole thing. And the first Impressionist art show was in a photography studio. But later on, when people decided, you know what, we really actually like this stuff, he was interviewed. And it was a great little interview. Um, anyone who does art understands, when do you know when you're finished painting something? When you're finished a piece of art? And so the interviewer turn, turns to my great grandfather and says, Well, Monsieur Renoir, your landscapes are beautiful. They're so lush and verdant. How do you know when you're finished painting your landscape? My great grandfather goes, Oh, that's a very good question. Says, well, it's when I want to enter the painting and touch everything. Hmm, good answer. But Monsieur Renoir, you also paint these beautiful nudes. How do you know when you're finished painting that? He goes, Ah, same answer. <laughs> Do you have a painting that's a particular favorite that oh. he did that maybe inspired you to be a painter? What ins Let me ask the question even differently. First, what inspired you to become a painter? Um, what inspired me? Of course, me? your family did, but it really is about you. You're the first one in a long line. So something triggered you to change your whole career to start to take up art. But it was always there. It was always there. Um, no matter what I did in life, it was always something kind of creative. I'm a gold and a silversmith. Uh, I've, I can cut and refine gemstones. Uh, I can sew. Uh, my mother was a, you know, a designer and everything. You know, it's, it was always very creative, always there. I remember I was the only seven-year-old that was allowed to run around with exacto knives. I would build cities out of cardboard and then stomp through them, pretending I'm Godzilla. <laughs> you know, um, my poor family, my poor mother. Um, you know those mobiles, you know, the things with the discs all over? I would go to the store and I'd see them, like, oh, that's awesome. I'd be painting or sculpting or something, and I would say, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Oh, right. So, it so was you there. felt connected. Do you have a favorite painting? Favorite painting? That is so tough. Out of my great-grandfather's, one of my favorite paintings has to be the Luncheon of the Boating Party, because there is so much history behind it. The people that are in it are astounding. They're all his friends. The, the, the locale, which is a Café Fournais, which still exists in Paris, uh, though you have to make a six months reservation uh, to get in, because they recreate the luncheon and you're part of it. And so you're in, oh, in the cool. luncheon of the boating party while there's a boating party and you get all the actors and actresses. And my grandmother is in it. Um, I met uh, one of the descendants of the people that was in there in a place called Roswell, Georgia. Oh my gosh. It was awesome. Um, his name, well, the, the gentleman in the painting has a brown bowler hat from the back, and he was uh, Baron Raoul Barbier, which is the ex-colonial mayor of Saigon. And he loved the Impressionists and the whole art world because he figured that uh, he was a poet. And when I met his granddaughter, in Roswell, Georgia, she recited some of the poetry. Everyone had come together. This place, uh, which had Monet and Manet, and, and everyone there would allow them to pay their bill in paintings. But here's the thing, they didn't think they were worth anything and got rid of them all. The um, Alphonsine Fournaise, the owner of the restaurant, died penniless. 
even though she had stacks of Renoirs and Monets and Manet and, and Pissarro and all that, you name it, it was all there. And she's like, well, they're nice kids, so I'll let them pay for, you know, I can use it to plug the holes in the roof. So. Amazing. Hmm? So, you know, were you, have you been worried or does it, do you see yourself having comparisons to your grandfather and your work? I, it used to bother me once upon a time, and I came up with a perfect answer. Um, it took my great-grandfather 79 years in which to reach his notoriety, his, his mastery of the thing. And come talk to me in 79 years. <laughs> See where I am then. <laughs> That's kind of fair. Figure it out. Now, you do your work with a knife. Mm -hmm. So explain to us, that, that so that we really, the audience understands, I mean, I certainly do understand, the difference between the knife and the brush, which is obvious, and why did you go back to that traditional way of the knife? Mm, sorry. Um, there are friends very, flying around. very, very persistent mosquito <laughs> on my nose. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> um, for me, it, it was actually... Yeah, use the knife. <laughs> it was a bit of an accident, actually. Um, I was painting with a paintbrush. That's how I had trained. And uh, my great-grandfather had this uh, sort of running joke with all the other artists. And um, he used to say that uh, the palette knife is only good for cleaning the palette, which is pretty much what it was for. Most artists paint on glass because it's easier to clean. We're all lazy. Can't help it. And so I was doing the same thing. I was using my paintbrushes all as normal. And, but I don't like to waste. And I'm very excessive in my painting. And so I'd have this big pile of paint left over. And it's not going to be good tomorrow, so what am I going to do? And I'd look around and I would find a painting that I had started, I didn't like, I didn't finish. So I mixed up all the leftover paint and I tried to resurface the canvas so I can use it again, right? And I couldn't get it perfect. A little OCD, you know, that's okay. So I said, ah, whatever. And I started to play and I started carving. At first it was fruit, wine glasses and wine bottles. I mean, a little cliche, but hey. Interesting. And then I'd leave it to the side. And I did this for a few weeks. And at one point, I had too much paint to throw away, not enough to cover a canvas. So what am I going to do with it? And I looked around, and I found the first one. And I started painting in. And it gave it that extra dimension, that, 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 that third dimension worth. You know, and it was beautiful. And I loved it. And then I was doing that for a while. And I decided, you know what? I'm taking one step more than I need to. And I started painting with the palette knives directly on to the canvas. And the toughest part is because all the paint goes on first. And I mix it all on the canvas. It's not mixed on the side. That's why I get oh vibrant God. colors. Wow. Everything's on there. And then I mix. Well, you know what's interesting? Impressionist art has been around for what? More than 100 years. Hmm? And your work is now in how many countries? 16. 16 countries. Mm -hmm. So, you're, so who, is there a country that loves your work more than another? Oh, uh, United is it, States. Is that right? Is well, it most popular in the United States? Um, somewhat. I mean, all of my major galleries and stuff are in the United States. But I have people, I've got this running um, sort of competition with this very nice family in uh, Beijing, I think it is. Uh, they come, their families keep sending them over to buy more of my art. And then so I give them a gift for it. And then, well, you can't gift without getting a gift so then we're trying to one-up each other the entire time <laughs> so it's my turn last time they gave me like this vase that came from the factory that was from that did the ming dynasty vases and i'm like you've got to be kidding me what am i okay fine so i'm uh carving uh out of driftwood uh, a lotus blossom that's going to go on a box that is comprised of the uh, wedges that uh, come off the back of canvases oh my <laughs> beat that <laughs> but stuff like that, you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, for me, it's all about the experience, all the, the places, the people you meet are wonderful. I, I love to, to go and to meet and to see, like here. Thank you. <laughs> so what's your favorite work that's with us tonight? Do you have a favorite? Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to pick a hard. child. It's like, tell me, which is your favorite child? I know. Yeah, well, okay, everyone does have <laughs> one, but you're not supposed to admit it, right? Um, myself, personally, I love these, this, this sort of style. It's a Tuscan sunset. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, another little story. 
um, Manet used to tell Monet to tell his best friend Renoir to get another job because he's never going to make it as an artist unless he puts black in his paintings, right? Because Renoir never used black. And Renoir used to tell Monet to tell Manet to cram it because <laughs> there's enough dark and ugly things in the world he's not going to add anymore. And I love that idea. And it's true. We are, I mean, everyone's here. You're in the most calming place in the, the world right here and now. But in, in the regular world, you have, are surrounded with stuff that I swear is created just to irritate you. I, uh, out there, I've got at least three things that will buzz, ding, or whichever at the worst possible time to give me optimum amount of stress. That's normal. So if I can create something that has a, a moment of peace, a moment of calm, then I've done my job. Because no matter what, you can take that minute to, to have that breath, just to stop. So, you know, when you think about Impressionistic art, has it changed from when your great-grandfather started to build that new form of art to today? Uh -huh. Well, yes and no. Think about it this way. Impressionism will last forever for one simple reason. It's uh, you. You uh, modernize the, the painting, the viewer. It's as much about what the painter doesn't paint that your mind fills in. So no matter from what period it comes from, it's modernized instantly by the viewer who is part of the painting itself. It's you and your mind. So it, it really changes in that, you know, with the, the, the time, with the, the, the modern society and how the, the mechanics behind it, but the, the basic idea of uh, lacking, or not lacking, of omitting part of the painting that, you know, will always forever. I'll give you a story. I was in New York doing a show. And at one point, I had a painting that had some buildings in the background. And this uh, lady comes up and says, how? How did you do this? So how did I do what? How did you paint the accusing eyes of my father in the windows in the building behind there? I said, ah, you know, the question you should really be asking yourself is, how is it that you see the accusing eyes of your father in a window behind there? So it is. It's the mind. It's the person that fills it in. Do you find that at times curators or artists or collectors would like to see you paint what your grandfather painted? Oh, sure. Um, on occasion, there is, you know, people who will ask, you know, who will <laughs> throw out, out, outrageous amounts of, of money at it. And... It's, it all really depends on the person. I have to meet someone. I have to see. I will never exactly copy anything of anybody, anywhere, because that's just not right. You know, even if Picasso once said that a good artist will borrow, but a great artist will steal, and I have tons of those stories too. But, I can't imagine. Um, you know, for me, I really want, it's hard. You've got this big, huge name that follows you around. To become a photocopier just reinforces a certain amount of stereotype that a Renoir is being a Renoir because he's a Renoir. That's not me. There's too many descendants that live to be descendants. You know, in today's schools, when you think about the artist <laughs> of the 19th century versus the artist of the 20th century and now the 21st century, art has almost become a non-class or a non-conversation of youth today. It's not that no one has artists. It's not. It feels different. How do you see, how do you see art in the future? I mean, it's not part of an education today. Well, it's not in the schools. You so almost have to do it as a separate hobby because many schools have eliminated art and and music and drama, unfortunately. Well, that's something that I actually I fight for, and I, I do classes in schools, and I and I will go. I mean, we we shut down Rodeo Drive once to have an art class at the top of Via Rodeo for for. You know, I think it was 50 kids, and we draw them in, and the entire thing. You, and I, I try to make people understand how important art actually is. And not just for art, for the aesthetics of it, for the, 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 the soul or the well-being. Think of it this way. It is scientifically proven, absolutely, without a doubt, scientifically proven, that the logical brain will give you every single option that it knows. It will give you all the statistics. It will give you all the knowledge and how it works together. But only the creative side can make the decision. That, Isn't that that's interesting? That's just how it works. Only the creative side can imagine how it will work out. 
to make a decision. The logical side knows it's like a library. The creative side is a librarian that gives you the book you need. And so it's so important and I fight for that and I go and I do art classes and I even do them sometimes at my studio. Uh, I've got paintings you know, done by kids all over and it's very, very important. Your family moved from France to Edmonton, Canada. <laughs> yes. That's a big change. Mm -hmm. It's a bit cold. Mediterranean. Did you Canada. find that you were able to transfer some of that traditional history to Canada? And well, then now you're in California. Um, you know, it starts, to, it starts to evolve to a different place. How do you remain for the next generation that they don't forget? Well, figure it. Going from the south of France, I was fairly young, seven, eight years old, when we went to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And it is beautiful. It is a beautiful area, but cold is an understatement. And every single winter, I would say, why would you ever put a city here? Why? But it's cold. other than that, uh, the paintings I had made there are very, are darker because that's just the way it is. Uh, in the wintertime, you have six hours of sunlight. You know, in the summertime, you get six hours of nighttime, but, you know, it's sort of kind of um, one of my favorite pictures from back when my friends say, this is a beautiful black and white picture. I says, it's not. It's a color picture. It's just wintertime, and it is. So translating the, that from when I just couldn't take it. I couldn't take the cold anymore. There was a, a record breaker. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, where can I go that is pretty much paradise? So... <laughs> Here I am. Did you keep some of the things from your grandfather and your family as the family's gone on? That sure. would be important. Uh, well, the majority, if not all, of the paintings are gone because the three sons uh, liquidated everything to make movies. Um, we still have his furniture. I have his furniture at home, and it's all very, he very heavy. It's all good, solid. I mean, think how far that's traveled. Oh, it's traveled. Right? It's traveled. I've got three brothers, and it usually took all four of us to move some of that stuff around. My gosh. How, you know, you do your work, how many paintings is it that you now work on at a, at a single time? At a time, um, it depends. Um, you can rotate them through, because I've got three days in which to paint anything at a time, but one painting for three days doesn't really work. So you start on one, you go into the second and the third, and you rotate through so that you have pretty much one painting a day is done. That seems pretty, that seems like a lot. Is that what it the masters be. did? Were they that fast as well? Oh, uh, they could be. Uh, when they you told had me to a be. great story about was it Rembrandt? I think we were talking a little bit about Rembrandt and, and Monet and all of the masters. I want you to share the story about Rembrandt and the church. You know how he got well, his permissions to paint, which is really interesting. I mean, Rembrandt is his own style, but there's just so this is a great story. Rembrandt uh, was pretty much a um, one of his major patrons was the the church was the Vatican. So anything he had to do had to be approved, uh, which we were talking about. Imagine the vaults underneath the Vatican and what art is in there. I would kill to see. But Rembrandt became known as the master of states, especially in his uh, uh, etchings. There would be numbers, different states, the first state, second, third, fourth, and fifth, because he would etch out something that is very innocent. And he'd bring it to the, 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 the person he had to, the, the priest, who would look at it and says, yes, this is fine. He goes, great. And he'd take it back and he'd work on it a little bit more and then bring it back. And it's a little more risque. Now, the guy already said yes. So, okay, okay, all right. So he'd take it back and he'd make a third state and bring it. And he's like, well, I already said yes twice. So I guess I have to say yes again. And then by the end of it, it was not at all the bunnies that it started out as. But it's interesting that, that someone had to actually, but think about that from a bigger picture, someone actually had to approve what his art would look like. Absolutely. Because did he that happen with, it didn't happen with Renoir. N well, in a way art. it happened with those guys as well. They were the outcasts of society, uh, of the artistic society, because it was, it was highly, highly regulated. You had to. Um, what started it off is when one of them decided to uh, shade something in blue. That was the beginning of it, the absolute beginning, when blue instead of black was used as shading. No, that's not right. You can't do that. And someone said, why not? And then it really went downhill for the establishment right then. Now, they your the great-grandfather was friends with Monet. Best friends, yes. Was there rivalry? 
Um, so yes and they? no. Uh, I got a great one. Um, they pretty much grew up together, almost grew up together. I mean, can um, you imagine being around in the time of Rembrandt or Monet or, or Wenron, seeing this on the, there? It's, it's just so interesting. Well, at one point, to think of it this way, even Van Gogh never sold a single thing in his entire life, uh, only after he died that he realized how much of a master he was at it. You know, the people wouldn't even take it as a, a, a trade for a, a bottle of wine. It was kind of ridiculous. But only later, uh, Renoir, Monet, Manet, all those guys, even uh, um, um, Morisot and all those, uh, the ladies, all included in, in that group sitting around in a cafe. is nothing different than a whole bunch of us sitting around in a cafe at that time. It's only time itself that tells the different tale that that puts them on a certain amount of pedestal um my great-grandfather used to go door to door to sell his paintings and he would discount it he'd come and say oh my name is pierre i'm a very little known artist i will give you this fantastic deal on a portrait okay now i'll give you an even better deal on the portrait of you and your daughter okay you your daughter the dog okay you your daughter dog by the tree. Okay, so he'd walk out with like five commissions and he would go door to door. Absolutely. Can't even and imagine. Oh yeah, but here's the funny one. Uh, when they came up with a bicycle that had the gears and all that, he ran out and he got one and immediately fell and broke his right arm, like broke it. So he switched to his left hand and there was no change in his oh uh, style. Gosh. People say, oh, he's ambidextrous. No, he wasn't. He was just stubborn. <laughs> Well, so I have the, my, my, I'm going to close with my question and give you guys the chance to ask some questions. What's next, Mr. Renoir, Mr. Alex Renoir? What's next for you? Oh, they say that uh, artists don't retire; they just pretty much die. Um, one of my favorite stories I heard is from, you know, uh, well, Monet. You know, by the end of his lifetime, his painting was so it was almost surreal. You know, okay, he was blind as a bat, but almost surreal. Where could it have gone if he had 10 more years? Um, my great-grandfather, it said, was painting on the bedpost of his deathbed. He was painting uh, yellow flowers and blue birds. Mm -hmm. And the last thing he said, reportedly, was, it's a shame, I was just beginning to learn something. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. As long as you don't, it doesn't become static. As long as it doesn't, you know, stagnate. You, you have to keep going and experimenting and all that. I've... You know, I'm, I'm working on stuff that is on glass. I, I, I play. You, you have to play. You enjoy it. They say if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That's right. That's right. So I guess my mother was right. Well, Alex's work is going to be here for a week if you just want to get up close because you really have to look inside these colors to see how this, this knife work actually works, which is quite brilliant when you look really close at it. And... I hope you enjoyed our art night tonight of talking to Alex Renoir. Thank you so much. Thank you.